It is, uh, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. For the last two days, I have said that if the Liberals actually wanted to get hydro rates under control, they should stop signing ludicrous contracts. Ontario has a surplus of energy. Stop signing contracts for more. This government can't continue to sell it at a loss. So why won't the Liberals stop signing these contracts, Mr. Speaker? All right, it's because the wind and solar companies donated $1.3 million to the Liberal Party. So the Liberals keep on filling their coffers and then return offer the people of Ontario band-aid solutions for this hydro crisis. Mr. Speaker, for once, will the government of Ontario think about the people of Ontario, not the Liberal Party? Speaker, that's an abrupt change of tone, isn't it? Uh, speaker, I can tell you that uh, on this side, we have made choices that reflect the wishes of the public of Ontario. We have made choices when it comes to energy to shut down the coal-fired plants that were damaging the health of Ontarians every single day, Speaker. It was a deliberate choice to reduce our GHG emissions and to clean the air that Ontarians breathe. Is there a cost to that? Yes, there is. Here, here. The uh, member from Leeds, Brindle, please come to order. Finish, please. So let's think back to the electricity system that existed in Ontario when we were elected, Speaker. It had been badly neglected. Important maintenance had been deferred. Answer. We were subject to brownouts and blackouts. We now have a clean, reliable source of electricity. Thank you. We are taking steps. Thank you. I may find myself in yesterday's circumstance where I move to warning, so I'm just putting that on the table now. If it continues, I will. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Acting Premier. Liberal math struck again yesterday. So let's see how the Acting Premier would do on this math test. If the Minister of Energy is correct in his claim that he says exporting power reduced the cost by $230 million, as he said in the Legislature yesterday, how do, they, how do they justify the fact that this government has given away $3 billion in power in the last three years? So, Mr. Speaker, what I want to know from the Acting Premier is how much have we actually lost? How much, of the, how much has the people of Ontario lost? How much are they paying more because of your exports of energy to Pennsylvania, to New York, and Michigan? Speaker, I, uh, I would uh, refer the, the Leader of the Opposition to a website called gridwatch.com. Some of you will know this website. I refer to it regularly. It uses IESO data to, on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, talk about where we're generating electricity, where we're exporting Remember it, from and where Renfrew. we're importing it. It's a really interesting look into our electricity system. The bottom line, Speaker, is we are part of a larger system. We import electricity when we need to. We export electricity when we have excess. And different parts of the province need to export and import at different times. It is part of a larger system, Speaker, and we have a clean, reliable source of electricity in this province. We've eliminated Answer. coal, which saves us $4 billion in health care costs, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, back to the acting premier. It's almost amusing to hear the government trying to reconcile 230 million in, 3 billion out, and try to spin that it's a profit. Well, let's talk about some more fuzzy liberal math. Canceling a 10% discount and bringing in an 8% band-aid solution. The government is still oblivious to how they're hurting Ontario families. The premier said we don't have a plan. Well, I've been very clear, Mr. Chief Speaker. Government Step went. one: stop signing these contracts for energy we don't need. And Stop this reckless fire sale of Hydro One. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the acting premier is: Will you actually act on energy? Will you stop signing these contracts and will you stop the fire sale? Yes or no? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, let's take a, a look back to uh, 2002. 
uh, Speaker, Ontario paid $500 million to imp the member from Leeds Grenville, second time, and I'm inches away from warnings. Carry on. So in 2002, when the uh, Conservatives were in office, Ontario paid $500 million to import electricity because we were not producing enough. In 2003, Ontario paid $400 million to import electricity because we did not have the capacity to generate that electricity. Speaker, we have made trip. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Wrap up, please. Speaker, reliability was a real concern, as was the environment. A 127 per cent increase in the use of coal, Speaker. We have now eliminated coal. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Start the clock. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. On April 19th, the former Minister of Children and Youth Services said Chief that she Government had read the Clinical Expert Committee report on autism services. On May 16th, the former Minister said that they were continuing to listen to experts and that her plan was based, I quote, in large part on the Clinical Expert Committee. But we just learned in the Toronto Star that on April 18th, before the minister made those comments, the expert committee wrote to the minister. They tried to caution the minister that her plan was detrimental to vulnerable kids and that there was no evidence to support kicking kids off the wait list. So clearly she had not read the report or listened to the experts. Mr. Speaker, if, if the minister had read the report, was she intentionally misleading the House? Withdraw. The Minister of Children and Youth Services, Speaker. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, want to thank the uh, leader opposite for the uh, the question, and uh, I know he uh, he publicly recognized the uh, the work of this ministry for uh, accommodating the uh, the children who are on the wait list uh, for uh, IBI services as we transition into a new program. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, what we're trying to do here as a government is to establish a new program here in Ontario that will open up 16,000 new spots. We, have a, uh, we had a, a challenge here in Ontario with a long wait list. Um, what we're planning to do is by June of next year to, uh, to build a new system uh, that will allow for children to be diagnosed earlier. We will open up new spots here in the province of Ontario, and we'll put in a system that allows young people to reach their full potential. And that's what this government and I think all members of this House uh, want to achieve, that's to give young that's people right. the ability to find success here in the province of Ontario, regardless of their ability. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Speaker, back to the acting premier. Let's look what the experts actually told the Liberals. They clarified the committee report cited by the ministry did not propose imposing an age cutoff. The letter went on to say the government was initiated action prematurely without sufficient consultation, and that the services outlined in the new autism program last spring will fall short of the needs these children have. This government has put families with children with autism through unimaginable pain and stress. This government looked those parents in the eyes and told them that they were following expert advice. This simply was categorically false. Mr. Speaker, how could this government turn their backs on these vulnerable children and their families? And how could they do that? How could they look them in the face and blatantly lie to them? The member will withdraw, and if it happens again, uh, the member will be passed on his question. Withdraw. Withdraw. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think the member opposite, the leader of the, of the uh, opposition, has to recognize that this uh, 
this um, um, uh, dedicated uh, half a billion dollar um, investment into our children is uh, is probably the most uh, significant investment into uh, any autism program here uh, in this country, Mr. Speaker. In addition to this, Mr. Speaker, we are setting up we are setting up a new autism program here in the province of Ontario that will allow young people to get the uh, the skills they need. The, the, uh, the ability to access the programs and services they need uh, so they can actually uh, get out there and, uh, and reach their potential. I think the member opposite uh, should be standing Answer. and actually uh, saying back to this government that we made the right de uh, decision, we're heading in the right direction, and that the, uh, the member will work with us to accomplish what we set out. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Acting Premier. You know, I appreciate that the government has finally realized that autism doesn't end at five. And I realize I've been, uh, I've been warned, but Mr. Speaker, I've been so frustrated with how these families have been treated. And I know the government is touting their new plan. They claim there is funding for children kicked off this wait list. But I have parents tweeting, emailing, and calling almost every day. They told me they have not received a single cent to help cover the cost of IBI treatment, despite this announcement happening. Not a single cent. So I have a very specific question for the government. And I would like a specific answer. Mr. Speaker, how many families that were kicked off the waitlist have received the promised funding? Has there been any funding delivered to the families kicked off the waitlist as of now? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, when I became the minister for this file, the first thing we did was uh, we sent Duffin out a letter Caledon to 24,000 families here in the province of Ontario. Uh, a letter from uh, from the ministry, from me as the minister, uh, explaining the Remember transition that was about to take place. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we set up a 1-800 number where parents across the province and families could call in and get uh, real-time information about the transition that's taking place. Mr. Speaker, we've dedicated half a billion dollars over the five years to transition into a new program. And yes, Mr. Speaker. What I would ask the Leader of the Opposition to do is, is rather than yes, standing sir. there and constantly complaining about this program, get behind parents, show them the direction in which they can access programs, each and, each and every Thank one you. of their offices. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Speaker, my uh, question is for the Acting Premier. The government promised that their throne speech would be a, a reset. Speaker, People were counting on the government to make life a little bit easier, to make uh, sure that they could get a, a good paycheck and fair benefits, to fix our hospitals and schools. But instead, the people of this province got a great big letdown on Monday. It wasn't a reset, Speaker. It was a disappointment. People know it's time for action in this province. Why doesn't the government? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, um, perhaps we could review some of the highlights of the throne speech that demonstrate we are committed to making life better for Ontarians, Speaker. 100,000 new childcare spaces, I think, is something we can all applaud, Speaker. 100,000 new childcare spaces. A significant reduction in electricity bills, Speaker, is something we can all support. The, the uh, third party has been calling for this action. We're now in a position to take that action, and we are reducing by 8 per cent the electricity bills and a further reduction for those who live in the most rural parts of our province, Speaker. We're also investing more to help companies reduce their, uh, uh, their consumption of electricity, and they will save money as a result Answer. of that. So, Speaker, we have responded and will continue to respond to the, to the, uh, uh, the wishes of the people of this Thank province. You. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, I'm sure New Democrats were not the only MPPs this past summer who were out talking to people and, more importantly, importantly listening to people. Speaker. Every backbencher on that side of the House, every minister must have felt the disappointment from the people of Ontario as we did. 
whether it was the decision to privatize Hydro One or the choice to ignore crumbling hospitals and schools. This is not what people hoped for, Speaker, and I'm sure that every Liberal minister and every Liberal member must have heard that. Does this government understand that? Do they understand where the people of this province are? Do they understand how disappointment, disappointed and, in many, many parts of this province, upset people are about the Question. functioning or misfunctioning of this government. Thank you. I almost think that the, uh, the leader of the third party hasn't been listening to one of the things that we are doing on this side of the House, Speaker, including 100,000 new child care spaces, including reducing the costs of electricity in this ah. province. Speaker, and what I've heard a lot about is the impact of, re of uh, free tuition for Ontarians with income, family income of $50,000 yesterday I met with a mom who, who told me that because of this her children will now be able to go on to college or to university speaker I've met with with young people in grade 11 and grade 12 who looked at me and said really when I said tuition would be free for those with incomes of uh, fifty thousand dollars or less in fact Speaker, the middle class and up to $160,000 income will benefit from the changes we're making on tuition. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, we're listening to the people of Ontario, and what they're telling us is that they want something better, and they deserve something better, Speaker. They are worried. They are worried about their future, but more than that, they're worried about whether there will be a future for the next generation in this province. Instead of hope, the people of this province are feeling extremely let down. Privatization, flat wages, robbing schools and hospitals of the resources they need. That's not what people voted for, Speaker. Is this government ready to acknowledge that they have gone off course and commit to making big changes in direction today? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, there are many items I'd like to highlight that we are steps we are taking to make life easier for people. But let me focus on investments we're making in young people in our youth. Speaker, an extra $250 million over two years to help 150,000 young Ontarians focus on skills development, on labour market connections, on entrepreneurship, on innovation. We're investing in these young people because we know that if we make the investments, that will be repaid many, many times over as they enter the workforce and make a real contribution to this province. Speaker. When it comes to childcare, as I said, 100,000 new spaces, which means more people will be able to get that solid foundation so that when they go into full-day kindergarten, which is another initiative that we're very, very proud of on this side, Speaker, when those young people go to school, they're going to be able to Answer. live to their absolute maximum, Speaker, and we will, fr we will allow those parents of those children to participate as okay. well. Question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, my next question is also for the acting premier. You know, I was I was hopeful. I was hopeful that today's or yesterday, sorry, Monday's throne speech would have been one that was uh, a session of uh, indicating a session of action that we were going to have here in Ontario. But instead, what we have is a premier that remains dead set on privatizing Hydro One. The government is defending an $11 minimum wage instead of taking action on a $15 minimum wage. There is no plan whatsoever to improve the quality of jobs in Ontario or to fix the schools and hospitals in this province. Child care, which this Minister deputy of Economic and Development seems and to uh, want to, to talk about a lot, remains far too expensive for far too many families, and that's not changing, Speaker. It is not a reset. It is yet another disappointment. Question. Why is this government letting people down yet again? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Well, you know, Speaker, we, we on this side acknowledge there is always more to do, and we always work hard to make things better. But I tell you, I think the leader of the third party has a kind of I don't know what the opposite of rose-colored glasses is, but they're dark glasses. She's looking at this great province through, Speaker. What we see is an economy that is growing, 6.1 percent growth over the past two years, leading the country, Speaker. When it comes to unemployment, our unemployment rate has dropped. 
by 6.7 per cent. That's been lower than the national average for 16 straight months, Speaker. Our kids are graduating. That was a graduation rate 68 per cent when we were elected in 2003. It's now 85.5 per cent graduation rate. Yeah, yeah. Education. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, people in this province need hope, not another letdown by their government. This province, Speaker, is at a key moment in time. Without big changes, things are going to get a heck of a lot worse for the people of this province. And instead of getting to work, the government is making things harder, making life harder for folks. Will this win government finally change course and start taking real steps that make a real difference in people's lives. Well, well Speaker, I, I, I've been informed by my, uh, my caucus mates that maybe it's orange-coloured glasses that they're wearing. They make everything look dark and gloomy, Speaker, because I can tell you any objective ob observer would say that things are better in Ontario now than they've been in some time. And it's because on this side, we've made hard choices. We've made choices to invest in infrastructure, to invest in our young people through our education, to invest in our health care system. We are continuing. Our economy is continuing to grow and expand. We are attracting immigrants from all over the world, Speaker, who are choosing to make Ontario their home. We're number one in foreign direct investment, Speaker. Yes, there's always more work to do, and our focus is always on making things better for those who are facing tough times, Speaker. But to say, make it the suggestion that all is doom and gloom in Ontario, Speaker, Answer. is just not a reflection of reality. Yeah. <laughs> Final supplementary. Uh, speaker, perhaps I was a bit presumptive to think that the Liberal MPPs actually listened to people over the course of the summer, because I certainly have a whole different story from the people of Ontario than the Liberals seem to have. People didn't want Hydro One sold off. That's what they told me. 80 percent of people don't want Hydro One privatized. Jobs, jobs without benefits and wages that you can't live on. Schools and hospitals that need billions of dollars in repairs. That is not what the Premier of this province promised when she ran her election campaign a couple of years ago. The government isn't just ignoring the problems, Speaker. They are making the problems worse here in Ontario. Now, Will this win government stop making things worse and start taking action Question. on the priorities that matter to the people of Ontario? Thank you. Well, well, Speaker, um, certainly um, the priorities of the people of Ontario were indeed reflected in the throne speech. We heard loud and clear that people want some relief on their electricity costs, and that's why we're moving forward with an H a rebate uh, in the amount of the provincial portion of the HST, an 8 per cent reduction in their hydro bills, and more for those in our most rural parts of the province. Speaker. We heard loud and clear that people with young children are really looking for more childcare options, Speaker, and that's why we're committed to 100,000 new childcare spaces starting in 2017, Speaker. Uh, we, uh, we are taking action on infrastructure because we hear from people that the daily commute is really preventing people from spending good Answer. quality time with their families. Speaker, we are making the priorities of the people of Ontario our priorities, and we are acting on those priorities. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. New question, the member from the Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is also to the Acting Premier. I'm sure you're very familiar with His Worship, Hector McMillan, the Mayor of Trent Hills. He's joining us in the gallery today. He has pancreatic cancer. He has pancreatic cancer, but like one of my constituents who is suffering from breast and brain cancer, OHIP won't fund the potentially life-saving procedure. He said that he has been, quote, essentially murdered and, quote, sentenced to die by the government. And what happened when he spoke out? 
he was told by the government to sit down and shut up, and now they're threatening to delay his OHIP panel. He was scolded for trying to save his life and for speaking out on behalf of the thousands of Ontarians every year who are candidates for the same potentially life-threatening treatment. Mr. Speaker, we all know that this government doesn't like its critics, but they can really defend trying to muzzle a dying man. Thank you. Thank you very much. To the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Mayor McMillan, sir, thank you for joining us here today. I, I, um, I want to start by saying how very, very sorry I am that you're facing this diagnosis, this challenge, the biggest challenge of your life, and your family and your loved ones are, are, are facing that challenge with you. I also want to say how very sorry I am that you have lost confidence in health care in this province. And it's my job, and I want to do everything I can to restore that confidence, sir. I can't begin to imagine what you're going through, the experience that you've faced yourself and your family, your friends, your loved ones. And, sir, I can only hope that were I to face a similar challenge, that I would demonstrate the courage and the fortitude that you have. As sensitive as this is, I remind all members that questions are put to the chair and the answers are put to the chair, and also uh, a kind reminder that there are no participation from members in the gallery. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker, and, and I appreciate the compassion coming from the Minister of Health, uh, but this is happening far too often. We've seen billions wasted, literally, throughout the health care system and other ministries in the government. And at a time when Hector and other people are facing life-threatening diseases, Sometimes they may only have a couple of months. It's the health care system that we need to work within that has to open up and, and limit the barriers that he faces. My father died of cancer, and it was the worst six months of my life. I know what Hector is going through. I've spent the morning with him. We've spoken many times. I didn't hear that you were going to help him. And I think we have to recognize that we do have two-tiered health care in the province, and that it is limiting for people like Hector. He's courageously taking a stand. But I want to know, will you help him? Will you look within your department? Will you make sure he gets that life-saving surgery? And will you help other patients across Ontario who are fundraising for basic health care? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I am doing absolutely everything I can. Uh, it's important, I think, for all of us to understand that this deci difficult decisions such as this are governed by the Health Insurance Act and the associated regulations. I have absolutely no discretion or ability to approve or reject an application that comes forward in that context. To do so would be a violation of that act by myself. I do understand, having spoken with Mayor McMillan, that the, his prognosis may have, in fact, changed for the better in terms of the staging of his illness. And I believe it's important that, as a society, from the bureaucrats to the highest level of clinical experts, that we demonstrate the flexibility that if a condition changes, if a prognosis changes, that we have the ability Answer. to provide the appropriate and best course of care in that case. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the acting premier on behalf of the people of Oshawa. People in Oshawa are coming to a tipping point. We are going to keep building, if we are going to keep building vehicles in Oshawa, this Liberal government needs to step up and get behind Oshawa's auto workers. Today it's Oshawa. But the negotiations between General Motors and Unifor will set the tone for the future of good auto jobs across the province. People haven't heard from the auto czar, Ray Tange, and people know that ministers crossing their fingers and hoping for the best is not a strategy. Will the government commit right here today to make auto jobs a real priority for this government? 
the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Of Economic Development and Growth. Well, I thank the member for the question, and uh, I mean, I, I don't think we could be any more clear than we've been as a government with regard to support to the auto sector. There is not a sub-national government anywhere in North America that's been a stronger champion of the auto sector than the province of Ontario. In fact, Oshawa would not, the Oshawa plant would not even be there today had it not been for this government with lukewarm support from the NDP and absolutely no support from the PCs when we made billion-dollar investments in the auto sector, including Oshawa. Both parties are, are negotiating hard. The negotiations appear to be going well. We wish them well in that collective bargaining process. We have an obligation not to get in the middle of that. At the same time, both parties know how supportive we've been in the past. Both parties know that we will continue yes, to be supportive in the future. Getting that plant uh, a mandate for the future is our number one priority, and we'll do everything we can Thank and you. need to do to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the summer, over the summer, I spent a lot of time speaking with people in Oshawa who were very concerned about the future of our city. Some of them work directly in the auto sector, but lots of them don't. Whether it's people working for GM in any of the industry spin-off jobs or all of the jobs supported by the sector, people know how important GM is to Oshawa. They're worried about what losing these good jobs could mean for the next generation. Ontario's New Democrats are in full support of efforts to keep and create jobs in Ontario's auto sector, not just for today, but for future generations of Ontarians. Government commitment to automotive should be ongoing, unwavering, and unshakable. Will the government get off the sidelines and commit to doing its part to keep these jobs in Oshawa and in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. This government has never, ever been on the sidelines. In fact, we've always been in the playing field. And Mr. Speaker, we've been running harder and more aggressively than any government in North America when it comes to support for this very important sector. And it is important to the people of Oshawa. It's also important to all the people in Ontario and our entire economy that we do everything we can to ensure that there's a future mandate for the plant in Oshawa, that there's a future mandate for Chrysler and Brampton, that there's a future mandate Member the for plants in Windsor, uh, the engine plants in Windsor, and all of. When you pay attention to the chair, you know that I'm standing. Member from Niagara Falls, come to order, because I don't think you heard me the first time. Please carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So this government will continue to be a championing for this sector. What I'll ask of the members to get on the same page with their leader, because they still propose a tax hike that would put a put a corporate tax hike on Oshawa and all other future investments that would hurt us more yeah. than help us. It's something that she really should look into with her own policy. New question. Uh, the member from uh, the member from Kingston in the Isles. Question is for the Minister of Housing and Minister Responsible for Ontario's Poverty Reduction Strategy. Firstly, I have to say congratulations on your new position. And anyone who digs a hole in the snow in minus 35 degree weather in the winter to truly understand homelessness deserves to be the Minister of Housing and Poverty Reduction. As Ontario continues to grow, we have to make sure that not only my riding of Kingston and the Islands, but all of our communities remain affordable and accessible to people of all income levels. Ontario's updated long-term affordable housing strategy will develop a new portable housing benefit that will transform the housing system. Will the minister explain what this benefit is, how it will make the social housing Question. system more efficient for Ontarians seeking housing assistance? Thank you, Minister of Housing and Responsible for Poverty Reduction Strategy. Well, thank you to the member from uh, Kingston and the Islands for that, uh, that great question, and I'd like to thank her for her continued advocacy uh, and focus on Ontario's social issues. Uh, ensuring, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that, that people have stable and secure housing is very important to our government and, and to me. Uh, the member is right about the portable housing benefit. Once developed, 
The benefit will have a major effect on improving the efficiency of social housing in Ontario. Currently, Ontarians need, in need of rental assistance rely on various programs across the province, many of which are tied to specific units at a specific address. The portable housing benefit would give people more flexibility to choose where they live. This means that when a person moves, the benefit moves with them. Mr. Speaker, this will mean more consistent Answer. support, more choice for people in need, as well as more flexibility for those who deliver the service. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, last Friday I was honoured to announce that the community of Kingston, located in my riding of Kingston and the Islands, uh, is receiving over $330,000 in new funding for the Survivors of Domestic Violence Portable Housing Benefit Pilot Program. I know that Sheldon Laidman of the City of Kingston was very pleased that there were sufficient funds to cover all 30 families on the waiting list in this category. Kingston Interval House provides emergency shelter and second-stage housing for women, children and youth who are fleeing violent circumstances. Last year, the centre received over 2,500 crisis calls from women suffering from domestic violence looking for emergency support, safe shelter and counselling. In the same year, 250 women and their children were living at Kingston Interval House. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain to the House how this benefit will help the survivors of domestic violence, such as those at Kingston Interval House, find safe and affordable Question. housing? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you to the member from Kingston and the Islands uh, for a second great question. Mr. Speaker, domestic violence is a very serious problem that crosses every social and economic boundary. It will not be tolerated in Ontario. That's why, together with our federal government counterparts, we're investing more than $20 million over two years in the Survivors of Domestic Violence Portable Housing Benefit Pilot. The pilot will provide ongoing assistance to approximately 1,000 survivors of domestic violence each year. Through the pilot project, good number. Through the pilot program, Surveillance of Domestic Violence will have the option to receive a portable housing benefit so that they can immediately find housing in their community instead of having to wait for social, uh, to, until a social uh, housing unit becomes available. Mr. Speaker, ensuring that housing assistance is flexible and not tied to one particular residence will help keep Thank those you. fleeing domestic abuse safe and support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Acting uh, Premier. Uh, Acting Premier, as you know, Ontario has been hit by a moderate to severe uh, drought this year. Farmers are saying this drought is burning off their crops and their livelihoods. Recent rains have come too late to be of any help. For many farmers, the 2016 growing season will be a year to forget. Mr. Speaker, I know rural issues are rarely on this government's mind. But farmers feed cities. Will this government promise they won't turn their backs on our farmers? And what are you doing for those in need right now? Thank you. Mr. Premier. Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know uh, my colleague, the Minister of uh, Agriculture, uh, Food and Rural Affairs is working very hard with farmers right now. Uh, we are working on a number of assistance programs. I know he's been out, out uh, meeting with them. There are significant up to 20 percent reductions on electricity coming. We are working on offset programs. I have personally, on climate change, working with the OFA on offsets and assistance to farmers, probably been to over 50 farm visits now across Ontario, uh, listening to farmers on the, the drought issues. We expect, as we do with our colleagues in Western Canada, that we are, we are seeing permanent changes to our climate, which are going to affect weather patterns. The, the, the droughts and these unprecedented heat waves that all Ontarians are expecting are going to make uh, the challenge of farming more difficult. Our Don Answer. McKay Thank from you. the OFA is taking a leadership role right now. Again, to the uh, acting premier, summer rain fall is highly variable in Ontario. This is always the case. But this year, instead of some farmers getting a little and others a lot, it's been a case of some getting a little and others getting nothing. 
Beyond a lack of water, many crops have been set back by drought-related weed and insect infestations. The drought is making it tougher to fight weeds and insects, but your government is banning neonics, making it even tougher for farmers. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask, where is this government's support for farmers to deal with this drought, especially those who ins whose insurance won't be covering the loss of both crops and livelihoods? Thank you, Minister. Thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as you know, we have a very strong range of business risk management programs to assist producers, including production insurance, the risk management program, and, uh, and Agri-Invest. And I know my colleague, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, but I also we have been saying and preparing for a long time for this while the official opposition denied climate change was happening. We, we have known very much that both our farmers and people who work in forestry are going to start to experience in our unprecedented new patterns of weather. The jet stream alone that moves weather through Canada is already 20 per cent slower than it used to be, and that dramatically is changing the length of rain. I did not hear the member opposite talk about climate Answer. change once or that. Our climate action plan developed with the OFA focuses on agriculture and resilience for everything from Thank greenhouses you. to resilient crops, and we are massively investing in those things. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the um, assi Assistant Premier. Con contamination in grassy narrows, paid in part by your government, said that it is possible to clean up the Wabagoon River. Great news. Yet, the Premier, producing no evidence whatsoever, said no to cleaning the river. Now, government scientists are saying that clear-cutting around Grassy Narrows territory will disturb the mercury, and no one is tracking the implication. Why is your government so quick to jump and say yes to logging and no to cleaning? Thank you, Thank you Speaker. Um, I can assure uh, the member opposite and the people of this province that our government is absolutely committed to working with Grassy Narrows First Nation and the federal government on this very important issue. Speaker. Uh, I understand and I am sympathetic with the concerns of Grassy Narrows First Nation. We have already taken action on the recommendations of the recently released report for Grassy Narrows First Nation. Uh, we're spending uh, $300,000 to support water, sediment, and fish sampling, Speaker, and this includes field work to determine the current levels of mercury and provide critical information needed to develop options to remediate the English Wabagoon River. We look forward to working and meeting with Chief Favister regularly to ensure progress is being made. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it is rather interesting that you have committed in May to fund the field work recommended by the scientists, but soon the river will freeze up, and within the change to conduct the field work will be gone for another year. Why is it that after you've made the commitment, there has been no field work going on at Grassy Narrow? When is the government going to come through with their commitment? But really, when are you going to clean up the river? Speaker, water is life. Thank you. Yes, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thanks. Matter of fact, Minister. Uh, Zimmer, the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, and I have a formal political committee of which Chief Fobister is a member, and we meet every month for several hours and review the entire implementation. Over $600,000 is currently being invested in the First Nation to run their own testing, and our scientists run alongside. This is one of the most comprehensive studies, and Chief Fobister has been very pleased with the progress. And I and Minister Zimmer make regular visits to Grassy Narrows, and the Premier recently met with Chief Fobister to review all of that. 
The science team, led by Dr. Rudd, is continuing its work. Our scientists are working alongside, Answer. and there's third-party science verification and the development of an implementation plan to remediate mercury in the river. Thank you. I can't imagine we could be doing more. No question. The member from Scarborough, Agent Gordon. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of International Trade. Early this summer, our government expanded our cabinet, which included the creation of a standalone Ministry of International Trade. I know the minister has been very busy this summer holding meetings with the start, no, building his new ministry and mandate. During the past few weeks, the minister has been traveling across the province meeting with municipalities and business leaders. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please share with the House on his goal? for the new ministry and what it means to the constituent of Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you. Minister of International Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you uh, to the member from Agent Court for asking. I was very pleased, excited when I learned that the Premier would be creating the first ever Ministry of International Trade. Speaker, over the last two years, we have been working hard to identify opportunities for Ontario. We have led many missions, supervised signing of many business agreements, and have secured nearly $4 billion in investment for the province. As a new ministry, we can deepen our effort and dedicate time and resources to further this success. Speaker, I want to continue to target key markets abroad where Ontario businesses can profit. And I want to continue engaging our business sector and work with them to identify ways our government can help. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. On Monday's strong speech, the government reaffirmed its commitment to international trade, particularly trade missions, Mr. Speaker. Having heard the minister's plan for his ministry, I'm confident that his work is he's working diligently to increase Ontario's presence abroad and bring jobs and investment to the province. And I witnessed, Mr. Speaker, firsthand last fall how hard the minister worked in organizing the China trade mission, which was a great success. I understand the value of trade missions. One cannot create business relationship without face-to-face -face contact. Despite this, Mr. Speaker, some people continue to criticize or doubt the value of trade missions. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he kindly please explain to the House how trade missions benefit the people of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, trade missions give us an opportunity to meet people face-to-face, -to, -face, to forge new relationships, strengthen old ones, and to sell Ontario. But what does that mean? For Ontario, Speaker, it means convincing foreign companies to open operations in our province, where Ontarians will be employed. It means 200 jobs from our Israel mission, 150 from India, 1,700 from the 2015 mission to China, and 1,400 from another mission to China in 2014. Speaker, it means increased business at hotels, restaurants, and tourist attractions when foreign delegations take up our invitation to visit Ontario. Speaker, and it means working with companies in Northern Ontario that have challenges Answer. to export over such long distances. Speaker, trade missions make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Halliburton, Fourth Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. We now know that the reality of your electricity rebate is 36 cents a day. In my writing, this is what your hydro crisis looks like. Thousands of cases dealing with people who can't cope with the stress of making their hydro payments and are desperately begging for help. People defaulting, adding to the growing list of those in arrears. People destitute and needing my office to seek bridge funding. People on load limiters, like we're in a third world country. Residents and businesses crushed by delivery charges in rural areas. Residents and businesses forced to pay massive balloon payments because of an inept billing system. 
Residents and businesses struck with broken or dysfunctional meters from the failed smart meter program. Question. Farms collapsing because of stray voltage. Businesses cutting jobs or shutting down altogether. Mr. Speaker, can the Deputy Premier please tell us how she came up with 36 cents as the answer? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Visit one. Uh, speaker, um, I, I wait with great anticipation for the supplementary in which the PC party will out outline their plan to reduce electricity costs. Speaker, but what I can tell you is what our plan are. We are reducing. Finish, please. Uh, we, we are taking 8 percent. member for Renfrew, second time. We're cutting delivery charges for the most rural customers by 20 percent, Speaker, and we're empowering uh, industrial businesses to reduce their bills by one-third through the Industrial Conservation Initiative, Speaker. But I do want to highlight other programs that are there for people Answer. who are facing real financial challenges, particularly the Ontario Electricity Support Program, Speaker, saves eligible low- to moderate-income households an average of 430— Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, to the Deputy Premier, you were not the one in the grocery line counting out your last coin to try and cover food purchases. Chair. You're not the one burning your staircase to heat your home. Chair, please. You're, oh, through you, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government is not the one hitchhiking to work because you can't afford a car that you need to get to your job in order to pay your electricity bill. These are real stories from my riding. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Deputy Premier finally admit that they have lost all control of the electricity situation in the province of Ontario? Thank you, Deputy Premier. So, Speaker, I do want to go back to the Ontario Electricity Support Program. Saves, and I correct my record, an average of $430 per year. Now, one of your caucus mates suggested that it wasn't his Chair, job please. to inform constituents of bad. this program, Speaker, but I say it is your responsibility as MPPs of all the people to inform people about the Ontario Electricity Support Program that is there for people in low and moderate income families, Speaker, to give them the, the relief. Member asked the question. This is in addition to the Ontario Elect Energy and Property Tax Credit for qualifying uh, individuals and families up to up to $1,008 per year, with a maximum of $1,148 per year for qualifying seniors. Speaker, our reductions are on top of these initiatives designed to support those with the lowest income. Chief Government Whip is warned. New question. Member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The throne speech was called a plan to build Ontario up for everyone, but there's nothing to build up over 1.8 million Ontarians with disabilities who still face barriers when trying to get a job, an education, adequate housing, or even basic health care services. According to the Alliance, working on behalf of Ontarians with disabilities, nothing in the speech will help a quarter of a million students with special education needs in Ontario schools. There is nothing to ensure that they will get an equal shot at the education they deserve. If this speech is about the wind government's priorities and building everyone up, why wasn't there anything in, this, in the throne speech about them? Well, uh, speaker, and I know that the minister responsibility, uh, responsible for disabilities would like to answer that question, uh, and I will certainly have her uh, make sure she's aware that that question was asked and to get that answer. But, Speaker, this government has been very focused on improving opportunities for people with disabilities. In fact, I remember very fondly when we passed the AODA Act, Speaker, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities. I remember so clearly the, the people that filled this chamber 
and supported our actions for people with disabilities, Speaker. When it comes to people on ODSP, and I'm sure the Minister of Community and Social Services would love to speak about initiatives designed to support people with disabilities to get back into the labour market. Speaker. Yes, sir. There's a significant focus on this very important issue because we know that we are all stronger when all of us have the opportunity to contribute fully to, to our Thank communities you. and to our economy. Thank you. Again, my question is to the Deputy Premier. I've listened to the speech from the throne, and there was absolutely nothing regarding Franco-Ontarians in Ontario. We need a, a Francophone university that is clear, and after the speech, all media have been wondering where was that promise of a Francophone university. We wanted a board of directors that was simple, that was clear. Why didn't the minister leave? Why did the minister leave behind 600 Franco, thousand Franco Ontarians, and didn't make any promises for them? In French. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, and thank you for, to the member for this question. I'm very proud to be able to discuss this topic today, and I would like to reaffirm that things are going forward. We are putting forward uh, an application process. The bill tabled by the member with uh, an accelerated process requires different settings if we want to be responsible, and I want to assure people here that the Wynn government is acting concretely. If we're looking at the speech from the throne, Mr. Speaker, I went all, everywhere in the province this summer, and all I've heard people talk about is actions that we've put in place, daycare centers, electricity, balancing the budget. All the comments I've heard con were about those topics. And to be told that we've forgotten Franco-Ontarians, I do not agree with that at all, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to take a moment. I wanted to take a moment to explain something. I've given some leeway in question period because of the throne speech to have a little give and take. Uh, that stops this week. Next week, I'll be more specific when your questions and supplementary questions stay focused on a single issue. The other, the other way, that's for debates, where the throne speech brings out opportunity to speak about the generic condition of the province because of the throne speech. So starting next week, I will be a little less lenient when it comes to questions that they must be related to the question put on the supplementaries. New question, the member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister of uh, Government and Consumer Services. Uh, first, I would like to, uh, through you, Speaker, congratulate her on her new responsibility. For many Ontarians, buying a home is the largest investment they'll make in their life. When making such a purchase, especially one with this magnitude, it's extremely important to ensure that there are no hidden problems with the home, whether it's a house or condo. Consumers often uh, rely on a home inspection report from a home inspector to make informed decisions when buying or selling a home. Can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services please inform the House on how our government is ensuring that Ontarians who purchase a home are protected in making this very important investment? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member, actually, from Trinity Spadina for his question. Uh, my ministry has recognized the need to establish a new licensing program to provide better consumer protection when making a decision as important as buying a home. Just last month, we, together, uh, announced our government's plan to introduce legislation that will take important steps toward increasing consumer protection in the field of home inspection. We want to improve consistency in the quality of evaluation on inspectors provide across the province. 
Consumers hiring a home inspector should be able to count on a certain level of qualification and expertise, and our government intends to address these issues. Speaker, through this initiative and many others, I will continue Answer. to work with Ontarians to ensure that they have the full confidence in the investment they make. I look forward to providing more information yes. on our supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, I want to thank the minister for her answer, and I want to thank her uh, work in uh, she's doing to protect home buyers and instill confidence into uh, into Ontarians. And I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, her predecessor, uh, Minister Orizadi and Minister McCharles, for their hard work on this particular file. As you know, it's very, very important to me. Buying a home is equally exciting and stressful, and it's important that the consumers. Uh, uh, be careful um, and well. It's important for con that consumers be careful and well informed uh, when, when making this big investment. I'm happy to hear the minister is committed to ensure quality service for consumers. Speaker, I know Ontario has a uh, large largest real estate market in Canada. The process of buying a home, especially for new homeowners, can seem daunting Question. and overwhelming. Can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services inform this House how our government is helping Ontarians achieve home ownership? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Minister. Thank you again for the member and for his question, but also his advocacy on this file. Mr. Speaker, the Real Estate and Business Brokers Act has been very effective at adding accountability and enhancing consumer protection to the real estate industry. The Act is administered by Real Estate Council of Ontario, referred as RICO, which regulates real estate brokerage, brokers, and sales for people. As a result, consumers have access to a more open and transparent real estate market. Real estate professionals are bound by a code of ethics and are registered with RICO, ensuring compliance across the industry. Our proposed legislation on licensing home inspectors will ensure Ontarians feel greater ease in entering the housing market and purchase, purchasing the right home for themselves or their family. Answer. Speaker, I look forward to working with prospective home buyers as well as professionals in the industry, such as actually our outgoing colleague Tim Udak Thank and you. the Ontario Real Estate Association. Thank you. Thank you. Let me apologize to the House, particularly the opposition, for my 30 seconds uh, of clarification that should have been done after, and I apologize. Um, it could have cost, and uh, I beg your forgiveness for it. Uh, there are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until uh, 1 p.m. this afternoon.